From the warm rolling hills of South Central Florida, this is Far Out Radio. I'm Scott Teeters, and today is Wednesday. It's June the 4th, 2014. Hope you had a great day. Dave Hodges, the host and producer owner of The Common Sense Show, is our guest this evening. Dave's weekly radio program, The Common Sense Show, can be listened to and enjoyed on Dave's website, thecommonsenseshow.com, and he's got a large archive section there on the site so you can catch up with Dave's work. The last time Dave was with us, we talked about professional sports within the context of social engineering. At football games, people are herded into stadiums and then scanned or groped airport style for their safety, of course. Uh, Dave wrote an article about this uh, back in April, and it's titled The NFL's Role in the Coming FEMA Camp Incarcerations. Now, before you say, no, that's just a bunch of bunk, read the article. And, you know, between the price of tickets and the TSA-style treatment, I'm amazed at what people will tolerate, what Americans will tolerate, just to see a game. Stay home. (laughs) It's a better picture, too. It's really quite amazing and uh, something that not long ago Americans would have said, no way. Uh, Well, anyway, you can catch that conversation at FarOutRadio.com. Look for the search tool and type in Dave Hodges' name, and you'll be able to find that show from April the 23rd, 2014. Tonight we're going to talk about something that's uh, almost as popular as sports, which Dave could talk about for the whole hour since he is or used to be a coach. The topic is, no, it's not sex, it's money. Yes, money makes the world go round, and Dolly Madison from the play Hello, Dolly was correct when she said, money's like manure. It doesn't do anyone any good unless you spread it around. Or at least that's the way it's supposed to work. But instead, what we have is a system of usury and debt that is crushing the life out of the planet. Even a light study of history during the last century uh, will show you that banks, without exception, funded and profited both sides of the conflicts so that regardless of who won, the banks always win. So who are our real enemies? But now we have uh, this new idea that Banks are too big to fail. And I just happened to read this this morning. There's a new meme going around that top bankers are too important to fail or to jail, I should say. Imagine that. Trying to spread this this silly notion that top executive bankers are too important to jail. That's called job security, isn't it? Yes, and uh, it was only a few years ago that top-ranking money officials such as uh, Henry Paulson told the Congress back in the fall of 2008, if the banks don't get this $800 billion bailout, there will be martial law. And, of course, Congress, Congress people said, yes, sir, Mr. Paulson, and they passed the bill. Now, regardless of all that, uh, it was. I thought it was amusing because it was a, about a week or two after they got all the money, a Department of Treasury spokeswoman said the $800 billion mark or, or number wasn't based on any particular metric. She said, we just wanted a really big number. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a real knee slapper. But uh, uh, money is a topic that is anything but boring. And although a lot of financial experts are very good at putting people to sleep, Dave Hodges has a new article out on his site titled, What Will Happen When the Dollar Collapses? And I certainly don't know when the dollar will collapse. But what I do know is that I remember as a kid in the 60s, I used to hear the men talking about men things. And one of the things I used to hear from time to time is guys would say, you know, I'm telling you, Dan, the bottom is going to drop it out of the economy, which always inspired some amusing mental imagery for me, like an eternal falling, you know, like a a forever gigantic, wee, and here we go, never to hit bottom. Anyway, Dave's with us tonight to talk about money, the economy, I know, what economy, and other interesting things. Hi, Dave. Welcome back to the program. Hi, Scott. Thanks for having me back. Dave, when did you first discover that the banking industry is not our friend? I think when I discovered the Federal Reserve truly wasn't federal. Um, I thought, really? It's not federal? Well, then who owns them? And uh, I I think I was a a young high school teacher at the time, and I was probably in about my second or third year of teaching, and I came across this information that said the Federal Reserve was not federal, and I said, that can't be true. And someone said, well, look at the Federal Reserve Act. And I thought, by golly, they're right. And then I looked into who owns the Federal Reserve, and I said, uh-oh, these are the people that Ida Tarbell warned us about, 
when Ida Tarbell wrote that book called The History of Standard Oil and really went after Rockefeller. So uh, I, I've known for quite some time. Uh, it's getting easier to convince people they're not federal. When, when I first went around proclaiming that, people thought I was wearing my tinfoil hat. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, if you if you just you know do a cursory watch of the news when the Federal uh, Reserve chairmen's uh, you know be it uh, Bernanke or Greenspan and I forget who who was in there before uh, Greenspan these guys stick around a long time but when they go before Congress and they uh, and they ask questions I know there have been several times where uh, Ben Bernanke was. Uh, Kind of rough on these guys in the sense that if if these questions got a little bit too too tough, like uh, such as uh, uh, there were some Congress people that were asking Ben Bernanke about that eight hundred dollar bailout, and they said, "Well, where did the money go? It's the American people, uh, you know." They're, they're blah blah blah, and he just basically Bernanke just said, uh, "We can't. Well, I'm not going to tell you." And uh, I remember seeing one Congress person that got a little testy with the uh, with the congressman or with the uh, Fed chairman, and somebody must have slipped this guy a note because uh, it wasn't too long after that, like within a matter of maybe a minute. He said, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I didn't mean to be so rude with my question. It was a reasonable question. Sorry, I don't remember it, but it was not an unreasonable question. Um, and this is the power that these guys have. And, you know, they, they act like when they appear before Congress to ask questions that they're doing Congress a really big favor because, after all, Mr. Bernanke, or whomever it happens to be is such an important person. So it's uh, so if you look at that, it looks like so who's in charge here? Well, obviously the Federal Reserve. So you know, even if you just look at it lightly, it's there. It is. It's staring you right in the face. But it's the connecting the dots that's often the hard part. Well, it truly is. And but uh, the day of reckoning is coming. And Scott, let me step aside here for a second before we continue with this. Before we leave our interview tonight. Uh, make sure you ask me about Monica Wesolowski for the State Department and her stolen kid. Monica okay, is, who? Monica Wesolowski. You're, you're going to want to pursue this with me as soon as we process this um, part about the economy. It's a breaking story. It's shocking. And uh, I'm trying to bring this to light to as many people as can hear it. But anyway, back to what we were talking about okay. here with the uh, the Federal Reserve. The party's almost over. The Federal Reserve, and I didn't write about this in this article, but I've alluded to it in other articles, they gave permission to the Chinese to buy up investor banks that own the Federal Reserve. So it's my belief from reading this that the Chinese are indeed buying up the Federal Reserve through the back door. Uh, The Federal Reserve is some day, if they're not going to be the Federal Reserve, I don't know what they'll be called, the Chinese Reserve, but they're not going to be here in their present form. And they're not going to be here in their present form because – We are truly headed for an economic collapse, and I base this on two factors. The number one is, you know, follow the money movers, and that person would be George Soros. When George Soros moves money, economies historically collapse. And last week, actually two weeks ago now, George Soros took his money out of B of A, Citibank, and J.P. Morgan, and a couple months before that, he ditched the S&P 500. And to me, those are ominous signs because, like I said, when he moves money, such as in the Arab Spring, economies crumble and there's civil unrest. And the second reason I believe there's an economic collapse coming is just common sense. $17 trillion deficit. You've got a $240 plus trillion unfunded liabilities through Medicare, Social Security, et cetera. And now the derivatives debt, which precipitated the bailouts, is estimated to be about $1.5 quadrillion. Now, let me remind everybody that uh, the conservative estimates that value the entire worth of the planet Earth come in at about $96 trillion. So we could pay off this debt, and we could bail out forever, and we, our, our great, great ad infinity children could go into the 50th century, Scott, and we can't pay down these debts. We are headed for a collapse. And uh, I just took my son the other day to see the movie Captain America, and there's a line in there from Robert Redford, who would be like the Fed chairman today or the head of Basil, and he said, sometimes to build something new, you've got to tear down the old. And that's what I believe we're witnessing. 
Before we move on, you meant you used the word quadrillion, and I love money terms. And for if that's getting a little like, huh, uh, for some of our listeners, I just want to you know, elucidate that a quadrillion equals a thousand trillion. And a thousand, therefore, a quadrillion would be one million billion. These numbers get to be absurd. <laughs> yeah, there's no way we can pay off these debts. Even if we didn't have a derivatives debt, let's just say we had the unfunded liabilities, which is only going to get worse with the baby boom generation fully coming into retirement now. But we would see the collapse of the economy just on this basis. We can't fund it. There's a time coming very quickly, if not this year or next year, where we're not even going to be able to pay the interest or service the debt. You mentioned that George Soros moved his money out of all of a lot of his positions. Was there any indication as to where he moved it to? No, there was nothing um, with regard to the paper trail, and, mm-hmm. and no media outlet reported the destination. But I can tell you where it went. It went. I bet part of it went to Basel, and I at Bank of International Settlement. And I would bet the other part went into the Caymans, which that money gets to be used for anything and emphasize the word anything. Right. And all the little nefarious things that Georgie Boy might be into, it goes down there. You know what they like to do in the Caymans? And I have seen this firsthand, Scott. I I saw this uh, almost 20 years ago. The, The elite like to play this little game they call an arbitrage. Now, arbitrages take different forms, but in this particular one, it takes about $60 million to get into this. Now, remember, this is 20 years ago, monetarily speaking. And they would play the currency exchange markets as the markets would open around the planet, and they would just jump from one market to the other as the market would open, and they'd move currencies and collapse currencies and inflate currencies, and they'd walk away with billions by the end of their, I think it was about a 16-hour cycle, if I remember correctly. Um, and, and I have firsthand knowledge uh, that they do this. And a lot of that money, that seed money, comes out of those Cayman Island banks for them doing this. And so, you know, Georgie's going to play his games down there, and he knows what economies are going to collapse, and he's going he's to match this currency versus that currency, and he's going to make money on the process. He's already betting against the U.S. dollar. And if you look at what's happening, there's a third factor You know, Putin is getting ready to squeeze Europe with their natural gas shipments that flow through Ukraine. He won't take the dollar. We see Iran with the backing of China and Russia and, to a lesser degree, the other BRIC nations selling oil for gold. And this is why we took out Saddam Hussein, and we're powerless now to act against Syria and Iran for doing the same thing. The dollar is soon going to be no more. You mentioned the uh, uh, the islands. I, I saw a film uh, a few months ago on Netflix for our Netflix uh, uh, subscriber listeners. Uh, the film is called "We're Not Broke," and uh, it's a fascinating explanation of how how the banking industry and the uh, uh, large corporations uh, launder money such that they don't have to pay any taxes on it. Uh, it, it's one of those stories that's very, very complicated. It's not something that you don't hear a whole lot about, and, and if you're not into that stuff, it's all new. Uh, but it wasn't that complex, and probably if you, if you went back, if I went back and watched it another, you know, once or twice, I'd have a better uh, grasp of it, so such that I could explain it. But it was absolutely fascinating, and it shows you how it is that a lot of these enormous uh, multinational corporations. Um, are able to have uh, astonishing profits, and they bounce it out of this country, and it goes over to that country, and someplace else, someplace else, and it ends up somewhere in the Caribbean. And uh, no taxes, poof, and they get to keep all the dough. <laughs> what a deal. Well, it's even more than that, and you're absolutely right. That That is the surface game that you and I can tap into and we can actually observe from afar. But I reported on something else here, and I don't have my documentation in front of me, but I wrote an article on this. Sometime back, where I wrote an article, was entitled, We Are Not Broke. And I, I agree with that assertion, but also for another reason. Our estimated mineral wealth underneath the, the earth, you know, here in the continental United States, is valued by various organizations 
to be worth about 125 to 140 trillion dollars. Now, this doesn't totally mitigate the uh, second debt, the unfunded liabilities, but it would take care of the national deficit. We could simply write off the uh, the uh, debt for the uh, derivatives and just say, "Hey, sorry, we're not paying you, Wall Street. Goodbye, and have a nice crash." Uh, while in Goldman Sachs, what's going to happen to Shearson Lehman, your main competitor, is now happening to you. We could do that, but we're not doing it. We're not touching this mineral wealth, and the EPA and other federal agencies are moving to actually prevent the extraction of this wealth from underneath the earth. And then, curiously, the Bundy affair situation in Nevada brought light to something, and I had an aha moment, and I said, oh, that's what they're doing. On the Bundy branch, they were uh, ENN, which is a Chinese military company, corporation, they were going to put a solar energy zone in. And I actually had, uh, I have a document from uh, BLM that talks about a designation called a solar energy zone. Sounds frighteningly like Agenda 21. Well, we have one here in Arizona, too. And what I've discovered with these solar energy zones in which the Chinese have heavy investment into is a lot of them are built over high mineral resource areas. And they're declaring these areas to be, quote, inland ports. And my friend Vicki Davis has done some great work on exposing the Chinese connections to the inland ports. And long story short, uh, we're not only turning our solar energy over to China, and this is our big conversion we're moving to energy-wise, but we're also going to be turning over our mineral resources to them. And we're hiding that fact, we're obfuscating it, by putting these solar energy zones over areas which are high and enrich mineral wealth that's underground. And um, it's it, to me, it's an undeniable trend curve, and it's the total giveaway of this country to the Chinese and the globalists. Hmm. Yikes. And, you know, there's a lot of times when uh, people buy a house. You know, you buy a house and you, you think you buy the land, but <laughs> oftentimes um, the, the land that you own is just the stuff on the top. If it turns out there's something way down under there that's really valuable, that's not yours. Somebody else is going to get it, but that's not yours. Um, Anyway, I'm kind of curious, Dave. You you mentioned uh, the nation's mineral wealth. And one of the things that always amazes me when we, we talk about, you know, what, how much assets do we have? We, you know, America is an enormous uh, uh, country, and we've got all kinds of things here that have intrinsic value, uh, and that never seems to count for anything. And when I say intrinsic value, like, you know, what, what's the Empire State Building worth and the Statue of Liberty and, and the Smithsonian and the Golden Gate Bridge and all of our national parks and everything? I mean, these are, these are tangible assets that have value that uh, I wonder if anybody's ever done a study to try to put a number on these things. I mean, it's not nothing. You know, like if you go in for bankruptcy uh, uh, procedure, you know, the lawyers say to you, so what are your assets? What do you own? You have stamp collection, you have exotic cars, you have rare books, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and, and you tell them what you have. And then it, it all factors in because that's wealth that you own. It's not cash, but these are tangible assets. Well, the country has tangible assets. And do you have any clue of what that is worth? No. And I don't think anyone else does either. Um, when you read about the value of the planet Earth, as I cited earlier in this interview, 96, 90 to 96 trillion is what you often get. Sometimes you get low end estimates of 75 trillion. But they basically make you think that that's the uh, um, GDPs, the cumulative GDPs of the country. And cumulative GDPs generally don't, uh, I don't think generally, they absolutely do not calculate idle assets like the Statue of Liberty. Certainly the Statue of Liberty has a monetized value, and you could probably sell it to someone if you could get away with it. But I don't believe that's included in any GDP figures. So the kind of wealth you're talking about, I I think, is uncalculated with regard to the debt ratio issue. Hmm. The other day I was reading a story, and it had to do with this statistic that said that – the amount of fuel being consumed is down by 75%, something like that. And it was based off of 
one of these uh, statistical charts that's prepared by the uh, Federal Reserve. And, you know, the Federal Reserve is, you know, okay, at the top, it's a privately owned bank, et cetera. But they do have people that are employed there and people who are working. They go to work and they do their job and they get paid. But one of the things that they do is they crunch a lot of numbers a lot of different ways. And apparently they put out all kinds of, of statistical figures, you know, enough to, you know, make your head freeze over. And, you know, it would be kind of nice if they would do something like, so what is the United States of America's, uh, what are our assets really worth? I mean, that's something that it's not nothing, and we can't just say, well, it doesn't really matter, because it does matter. No, it does. In fact, I found the source of that figure that I just gave you about underground wealth, it's from something called uh, it's the Institute for Energy Research, and they're contracted a lot to do estimated values of land, and they said that, that based on figures from two years ago, they would estimate the underground assets of the United States to be worth a minimum of $128 trillion. And then they went on to say, if we tried to monetize this and just say take oil and natural gas leases, that we could make over $150 billion a year just on, just on the leases alone, which hmm. only represents a small partial value of the wealth. Uh, but this wealth is not being tapped into. And the other thing you look at, too, is you take an asset, say, like oil off the north shore of Alaska, which is supposed to be far greater than any of the oil sources in the Middle East, and we don't touch that either. So when you look at all these issues here, what are we saving these resources for? They belong to you and I, Scott, the American people, but they're not going to be enjoyed by the American people. I think they're going to be taken over by the people who we are presently in debt to. Well, Dave, you're thinking like a citizen and not like a world citizen. <laughs> That's what it comes down to. You know, that, you know I, I shouldn't have been born with a flag wrapped around me. Oh, well, oh, well. Dave, we've got music playing. We're going to take our commercial break. We'll be back in just a few more minutes with our guest, Dave Hodges. And we are back. Welcome back to Far Out Radio. Our guest this evening is Dave Hodges, and we're talking about those money guys, those highwaymen called the bankers, the banksters, uh, the white shoe boys, as uh, as Gerald Salenti likes to call them. Yeah. Dave, I, I'm not sure if, if this has ever occurred to you or not, but I take in a lot of information from here or there. I listen to a lot of people talking about things, and every now and then, you know, a little a little nugget of an idea, or something will sort of jump out, and I go, "Hey, you know, that sort of relates to that other thing that so and so was saying." And then you start to connect, make connections on things. And one of the things that I've noticed is this: that it seems like the rulers of this world, basically for the most part, will let the people. Do whatever they want to do. They don't care. You want to be a movie star? Fine. You want to raise cars? Fine. You want to start a business? Fine. You want to do whatever you want to do? That's fine. They'll pretty much leave you alone, except for one thing. Don't mess with the money. You mess with the money, they're going to come crashing down on your head. Now, part of how I came to this conclusion was something that I heard Jim Mars say one time. He was talking about money and the bankers, and he said... He says, I don't think it's any coincidence that the last two presidents that we had that tried to issue our own government money, both of them ended up with a bullet in the head. And those guys were Abraham Lincoln and Jack Kennedy. And then I took it a next step further, and I was thinking about the, the stories of Jesus Christ. And it seemed like, from my perspective, and it's just an idea on my part, that if he hadn't lost it in the temple and basically messed with the money, they had to let him go. I like, got oh, fine. Yeah, talk about your talk. You know, do your sermons. We don't really care. But he didn't. It seemed like he didn't get in trouble until he started messing with the money, and that's the way it'll always get you into trouble. Bring it forward, and this is a bit of a lead-in. But I, I can't help but wonder about this this rash of dead bankers, and I'm not sure were these guys caught messing with the money. Or are they sending a message to other people in the banking industry that are too close to the, the real books, you know, not the cookbooks that they tell us all about? Uh, what's your take on this outbreak, this rash of dead bankers? It reminds me of the of the dead microbiologist from yeah, back that's in a really good parallel. 2001. Uh, I, I totally, totally agree with that. Um, the dead bankers it, it, clearly. There's a connection. What the connection is is speculative because the reason you have people killed is because dead men tell no tales. 
So you have to start looking at what they're doing, you know, who they are, what positions they occupy. And what I've been able to learn from this is the fact that these aren't the top boys. These aren't the guys who are saying, okay, this is what's going to happen and all the dominoes fall. These are more mid-level managers. Mm -hmm. And the reason that you kill a mid-level manager in the, in the mafia is to erase an evidence trail. So, I, you know, and, and I don't know why the bankers would be worried about this, but what I've concluded is it looks to me like they're murdering off the witnesses that could put some of the big boys in prison. And I don't know why they're worried about it, because they're so firmly in control right now. But to me, if, if it was a war of one banking interest against another, you would see higher-level assassinations. Um, and, and we're not seeing terribly high-level assassinations. We're just simply seeing bankers. And bankers dying in very conspicuous ways so as to serve a message. So beyond that, you know, I think it's hard to speculate and say exactly what it is. I know a lot's been written about it, Scott, but I have to say it's kind of one of those open questions still. Yeah, it's bizarre. You know, at, at first it was a couple, two, three, and you go, well, you know, hey, like bankers died too. You know, bankers have accidents, but then it just keeps going on and on. It was just one the other day I, I saw where the – some banker fell, and, and yeah, you're right. There are always these mid-level, you know, like junior VP or whatever. Uh, and even if you're a vice president, it doesn't mean you're too far up the feeding chain because uh, there's a feeding chain behind the the one up front. Uh, this guy was out hiking uh, someplace, and uh, gosh, wouldn't you know it? He got too close to the edge of the cliff, and oops, there he goes down a thousand feet. <laughs> Could it be an accident? Yeah, but you know, gosh, you know, he wasn't he wasn't working at the hardware store. He worked for a bank. Yeah, just like a former uh, CIA director drowned while uh, canoeing outside his his home. Yes, um, it, late at night, yeah. late at night in a in a uh, in a rainstorm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Wearing his perfect, pajamas. Perfect weather for canoeing and kayaking. Um, yeah, I, I agree. It, it, the the deaths have been more than suspicious. But, but it looks to me like when you kill off mid-level people, I think they're usually evidence trail murders. And, and, and I don't know really, like I said, what are they afraid of? They're so firmly in control right now, it's not like there's going to be a Nuremberg trial for bankers. No. <laughs> so, I, I, you know, I, I don't know what's going on. The other thing, like I said, that occurred to me was you could have one banking faction of the New World Order versus another, and these are hit jobs, but... They're sure low-level hit jobs. I mean, we're not getting a senior VP of J.P. Morgan. Um, we're, like I said, we're getting the mid-level guys. And, and to me, if you're going to conduct a hit to, to make it to send a message to a rival financial empire, you, you would really want to be a little higher up the food chain. So that's a good question. It's an open question. It's caught everyone's attention, but I don't think anyone really fully understands why. Um, do you know, back to this idea of the dollar collapsing, and I wanted to mention this as we were going into the break, um, I don't think we're going to have to wait real long. Now, I'm a guy that stays away from date predictions for the most part, but did you know America has 80 million young adults uh, who are part of what they call the echo boom generation, and 60% of these 80 million uh, under the age of 30 still live with their parents because the economy is not good. But usually in their 30s, these people start to find their bearings and kind of get their niche and get started. And, mm -hmm. of course, it's delaying childbirth. But when we look at these echo boomers, when all 80 million of them are invested in the economy, the economy is going to boom. And that's not what these uh, the elite bankers want. They want to collapse this economy. Uh, like I said earlier, they, they want to destroy the old so they can introduce the new. Out of, out of chaos comes order. And I think that before... You see the echo boom generation coming into full prominence economically. I think they have to collapse the dollar before that happens. Otherwise, America is going to see an economic resurgence that will stave off the collapse of the dollar, at least for a while. So that's one thing I wanted to mention. I think that's extremely important. And the Federal Reserve is also really betting on an economic collapse, too, Scott, because they're buying up gold like there's no tomorrow, as is Goldman Sachs. I mean, it was April of 2013 when they did put out, They told their bro uh, brokers to do a put option on gold. And so they sold gold like crazy, and then they turned around and bought it up on the cheap. 
And we see the Fed doing the same darn thing. So, you know, I, clearly the Federal Reserve is getting ready for the economic collapse that's coming as well, too. Um, is it going to be a year, two years? You know, I think it's kind of a fool's errand to say, but it's certainly coming. Yeah, watch out when you hear stories about those put options because somebody's got the inside scoop that uh, something's going to fall down real soon. You know, those put options, are, that's what a strange thing. You know, you, you buy an option, either a put or a call option, you know, that gives you the uh, the opportunity but not the obligation. And, you know, people trade, put, they, people trade options. It's a, it's a crazy wild world, that whole put and call option stuff. It's really nutty stuff. That, that people can make so much for having done nothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I agree. And let me give you one more sign that I think things are ready to collapse. Uh, the Federal Reserve was spending about $40 billion a month at one time. They've leveled off a little bit. But Dave, they were hold off on that level off because I, we didn't hear our break music. So we're going to take our, uh, our commercial break. We'll be back in about two minutes, and we can pick it up from there. Be right back, folks. Scott Peters is actively marketed to Rents.com readers with banner ads and is supported with pages and archived programs at RentsRadio.com. The popular show has a growing base of loyal fans and is promoted on its own site, FarOutRadio.com, and has an aggressive social media campaign. And now you can benefit from this remarkable new program. Contact FarOutRadio.com for very affordable online and on-air advertising opportunities. That's FarOutRadio.com. Okay, we are back, and uh, we're talking to Dave Hodges this evening about money. Okay, Dave, we were talking about put and call options, and you were just about to get into something. And wouldn't you know, age is catching up to me, Scott, because <laughs> I turned my head and it fell off the side of it. Um, oh, <laughs> I just, wow. Uh, well, okay, what, what I was basically saying leading up to the break, and I'm glad I'm not the only host that doesn't always hear his, uh, his break music. That, that's happened to me more than once. Um, <clears throat> but what I was alluding to was the fact that uh, the signs are all there. The Federal Reserve is, well, was buying up $40 billion of mortgage-backed securities. Well, houses have tangible uh, value. Uh, gold has tangible value. And when you see the Federal Reserve buying up these tangible assets, you, they basically are telling you that we don't trust the intangibles any longer and the credit system is going to roll up. And then when you couple that with George Soros taking his money out of the three major banks and ditching the S&P 500, you know, I think we've got a real clear trend curve here that the average American needs to pay attention to. And what I've advocated for is get as much money out of the bank as you can, leave it down to bare bones to where you just pay your bills, and start buying things that you're going to need for the future. Um, how about uh, some food, and some water storage, and, and guns and ammo? Uh, these are things I think people would be well advised in this real volatile climate we're in to prepare. Pay off your home mortgage as much as you can, because we could go broke as a country, but that's not going to keep the Federal Reserve from coming to claim their due, you know, with your home mortgage. And they're the ones that really are starting to buy them all up. And uh, so that, that's what I'm advocating for right now based on these trend curves. And the other thing is, too, why, why should we give our money to institutions when they pay you point zero zero whatever percent mm -hmm. for your money that you house there, and then they harass you when you take it out? They report you to the IRS if you're dealing in any kind of large amount of cash, like you're automatically a terrorist or a drug dealer. But then they turn around and loan you money anywhere between 12 and 20 percent. I mean, that's not a very intelligent business deal the American public has made with the banking institutions. And I think that we all need to rethink our participation in this system. Yeah, Dave, but those baubles we buy are just so cool. <laughs> There's always a new bauble. There's always a new, you know, iPhone thingy, whatever. That's that people just get mesmerized. I, I, I'm convinced that you know technology has become the the big hypnotic thing that's put everybody into a hypnotic trance. Um, I think it was well, about a year ago <laughs> when the new iPhone 5 came out. They were interviewing people who were standing in line for hours and hours to get a stupid phone, and this one guy said. 
he, they, they saw him on the way out. And it's just an indicator of how, how crazy people are, gaga crazy. They are over tech, tech things, toys that they end up putting on their credit cards. They interviewed this guy and they said, what are you going to do when you go home with that thing? And he says, I'm going to slowly take it out of the box and I'm going to enjoy it. And it's going to be better than sex. And he had that, the way he was saying it, you had that feeling like, he's not kidding. <laughs> no, he's not kidding. No, and as long as you have um, some and, extra and room that's how we're taught plastic. to look at this. You know, the best thing about going into a bank for me is the free suckers you get. And anybody who continues to leave their money in the bank is just what I enjoy at the bank, a sucker. Maybe, there's, mean, a more, maybe there's a more interest. subtle reason why they give you those suckers, because we're the suckers. <laughs> they're, well, they're mocking us uh, in one sense. Uh, hey, do, do you mind if I if I uh, mention what I'm working on uh Right at the moment? Sure. This is a breaking story. I was contacted about five weeks ago by a State Department employee with a security clearance, and her name is Monica Wesolowski. And I think someone politically thinks that she knows a lot more about things, maybe like child sex trafficking, uh, than she does. She doesn't really know anything through her job, but she has had brushes up with people who have, let's say, had some controversy in this area. Um, one night, the CPS showed up with the SWAT team and took her son, Dylan, her five-year-old son, Dylan. And I'll cut to the chase because time is short. After roundabout accusations, none of them proven, no charges ever made, they ended up taking her kid away from her without so much as charging her with anything. And they put her child with uh, two gay fathers who are now, we believe, sexually molesting the kid. And I've seen the evidence. And being a former mental health counselor, if this case were here in Arizona where I live, I'd be compelled by the evidence that I've seen to go to the authorities and report it. And I have a report requirement because of my mental health training. And this is clearly going on. Well, now they're trying to sever her parents' rights entirely because she dared to come on my show. It's so bad in Fairfax County, Virginia, Scott, that the assistant county attorney wrote to Monica and, and, and basically said, stay out of the media. And the CPS has now told her, you're not seeing your kid or not going to see him hardly at all. They're trying to sever her rights because you went to the media, and in doing so, you've endangered your son, and you are psychologically unstable. And they have a hearing on this Monday to try to basically remove her parental visitation rights. When they get into December, which will be a year after the boy was taken, then they can totally take the kid away, and she'll never know where he's at, and she'll never see him again. Um, I've been at the forefront of trying to expose this. I've been contacted since I ran the first story by some ex-Virginia CPS agents to tell me this is par for the course. And let me tell you the ugly side of this. CPS all across this country, because they're now federalized under Obamacare, uh, they are disappearing children, like 80 kids from Oklahoma last year, and I wrote a story about that but they're now disappearing children into child sex trafficking rings. And what Nick Bryant wrote about over a dozen years ago called the Franklin scandal, mm -hmm. he is right on the money with what I'm finding. And here we have a State Department employee with a prominent security clearance. She, I mean, she's done preparation work for President Obama for his travels. She works with ambassadors. She doesn't clean the toilets at the State Department. She is of some prominence. They have declared her to be a national child abuser. She's on a list for 18 years, and this could affect her keeping her job when she has to renew her security clearance. There was no due process involved in this. I could go on and on, but you get the idea. I'm coming out with an article in the morning that's going to detail the who, what, where, when, and why of what these officials are doing to violate her constitutional rights, and it will be up on my website at thecommonsenseshow.com. But, Scott, as I found out, this child sex trafficking is huge. Independent of Monica, I found one of the reasons that uh, Chris Stevens was murdered wasn't just to cover up the, dr the drug running that supported the gun running, uh, it to support al-Qaeda in their overthrow of Gaddafi and the attempted overthrow of Assad in Syria, but they're also filtering off, um, or should I say skimming off, child sex operations to do the same thing. And that we were coming up on an election in three months when Stevens was killed, and I believe he was taken out to cover up this fact as well. well. That's quite a mouthful, I know, in just a few minutes. But that's what I've been working on. And my website was down for three days, and I'll tell you why. I received some pretty significant warnings not to continue. 
So I did a strategic withdrawal, and I took my website down for two and a half days while I contemplated my actions. Well, I'm back up and running. As one of my friends said, if you're going to be on the list, you better be on the top of the list. So Dave, that's not, what Dave Hodges a, is into right now. You were warned not to continue. continue oh, yeah, very what? strongly, yes. For the uh, Continue doing of, what? Uh, continuing to report on the sex trafficking, uh, oh, linking okay. it to Benghazi, um, and uh, I've decided the safest place to be is on top of the mountain, so I'm continuing with that work. What mystifies me, Dave, is that, you know, and this is, this is not unrelated to the Jimmy Savile story and BBC and the, you know, the connection to the royals and everything. It's mm -hmm. such a, an enormous thing. I'm, I'm, I'm unfortunately, you know, kind of up to speed with that Franklin case. It's one of those stories that, man, you, you hear it once, you know, thanks, now I got that in my head. Uh, but what always amazes me about this stuff is that it's so big and there's so many children being picked up and it seems like it's gigantic, but who's doing this stuff? And how is it that we can't seem to identify people who like to abuse children like that? Uh, it's, well, I'll put you know, some I, names on it if you'd like me to. Okay. I'll tell you, and this is public information, going back in the past, uh, you'll even have intelligence community figures tell you this. Uh, openly, they'll say this. Wells Fargo Wachovia has been busted for it. They paid a fine. You know, I think it was a $400 million fine. No one went to jail. Um, DynCor, when they were still going by that name, oh, they paid Dyncor, a huge yeah. fine. No one went to jail. Uh, the, the Bush administration has been strongly implicated in this through the Lawrence King situation involving John DeCamp and mm -hmm. Herman Cain. And uh, my friend Brandon Turbeville, who writes for Activist Post, really did a great job exposing the connection between Savile and uh, Prince Charles. And the link goes all the way up to the Queen, who I believe is one of the big, biggest human flesh peddlers on the planet. And she does it through organizations like Common Purpose and so forth. I mean, um, that's just for starters here. The CIA is trafficking kids. Uh, they're using, you know, front corporations to do it. But, but they're trafficking for purposes of raising money for regime change, and it's Iran-Contra, just child sex trafficking style. Ick. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're just getting me started on this. And, you know, I'd be happy to come back sometime. I love your show. I absolutely oh, love you. your show, and I'd like to come back sometime and talk to you more about this because I think there's no, nothing more sacred to a civilization than the welfare of its children. And our children are under attack right now by a corrupt CPS system running amok across this country. Yep, a topic for another time. Dave, we're all out of time. <laughs> well, it's been my extreme pleasure to be on your show again, Scott. And, and uh, keep up the great work because I follow you often, and you're, you're just a true warrior for liberty. Well, thank you very much, Dave. I appreciate it. And uh, you, you keep up the good fight, too. Take care. Okay. That is our program for this evening. Tomorrow night, our pal Tim Swartz will be back with us, and uh, we'll be talking about some high strangeness. Uh, Tim and I have so many high strangeness-type topics uh, to key in on. Uh, we have to get our heads together and sort out just which one, but uh, it'll, it'll be fun, and I think we'll probably be doing something like things that go bump in the night. So it'll be a good time tomorrow night with Tim Swartz. That's our program. Take care, be well, and we'll be back tomorrow night with more Far Out Radio. Small business entrepreneurs, do you want to optimize your website, get more business, but your budget is small? So what's your wish list? A professional look, a blog site where you edit and create pages yourself integrated with social media tools? This is Jeff Rents for FreeSpiritDesignStudio.com with Scott and Karen Teeters. You can get a great-looking turnkey 3.0 WordPress website very inexpensively. Your new site will be professionally designed, set up fast with search engine, social media, and blog optimization. And you'll be trained how to easily maintain your own new site. Get a free consultation today with absolutely no obligation from FreeSpiritDesignStudio.com. Take the first step to owning a site that your business deserves, created by FreeSpiritDesignStudio.com.